Thank you, people to join. Should have joined early. Okay, great. There's people there. Hi, everyone. I'm gonna, I know I'm a minute late, but uh, usually I do this from home. And today we're doing it from live from London. So um, I'm just gonna give everyone a few minutes to, to join and then I'm gonna get started. Um, but I'm really excited to welcome everyone to our Reproductive Report webinar, where we go through our findings. It's very much part of our initiative and our motivation is to collect the data, analyze the data and share it with people so that it has impact, so it has reach, but also it has tangible benefit. Um, so often, and I see this as a scientist, research, it goes on behind closed doors. It takes months to publish, years sometimes. Um, it's disseminated among the scientific or clinical um, community, and it is not disseminated and explored for the people for whom it matters. And so it stays within this echo chamber of the researchers who have an interest, um, as opposed to being relevant to the people who it will benefit and impact. Um, I am going to... Somebody raised their hand and I don't know whether it was on purpose or not. I'm used to lecturing, so I'm used to people putting up their hands and I have to answer their questions, but I think you put your hand down now. Um, you're all my students for the next 45 minutes. Um, let me just share some of the slides and we'll get started. Thank you for giving me your lunch breaks or whatever time it is that you're giving me. Um, I'm really grateful for you all being here. Um, and we made it our commitment to put together an annual reproductive report whereby we would be able to tell all of you, the people who contributed to this research and the people who have followed us on our journey, the insights that we are seeing so often. And I see this every time I'm at a conference related to women's health or fertility, we look into huge detail on whether it's embryology, whether it's individual metabolomic factors that could influence how an embryo grows to determine the outcome from an IVF cycle. And I keep thinking like, why is it that we're not looking further upstream? There are really simple clues that lead us to insights into what a successful either IVF cycle, egg freezing cycle, or just reproductive cycle could look like in people. And yet nobody is really looking at what we do in our day-to-day -day lives that could be impacting us. So um, really that's what this is about. Amazingly, I sat or I spoke at a conference two weeks ago and it was about all of the new technologies in assisted reproductive technology, i.e. IVF, egg freezing, all of these different ways that we can help people have babies. And I was in the future technologies section and why I find that actually funny is that why is it that it's a future technology to simply ask women about their lifestyle factors, their health, to check their hormones, to check them for a diagnosis? That shouldn't be a future technology. In truth, one of the most common things people say to me is that's something that should have already existed. Why does this not already exist? And to put into context how strange it was to be in the future technologies panel of speakers, um, the person who was speaking after me was speaking all about how the European Space Agency was investing in how we understand more about human reproduction in space. So that will tell you <laughs> the prioritization that goes on. We are more interested or as interested in terms of funding in understanding how, how we can improve astronauts um, reproductive function or prevent or damage or preserve reproductive function in astronauts, majority of studies obviously on sperm, uh, then we are on the everyday woman who is living, breathing and reproducing today. So um, this is for the here and the now. Um, I think we have conducted this study because accurate data on women does not exist. And I am really sick of that narrative about the data not existing. And I'm so proud to be contributing real world stats and real world data from everyday women. Um, so often we rely on statistics. We rely on textbook answers. I have actually just contributed to a textbook. I wrote the chapter over probably 18 months ago or a year, and it takes a long time to get a piece of uh, information into a textbook. And 
things change over time, things change. So what we see is actually a textbook woman is not our mother or our grandmother. Actually, it's the influences, the exposures that we have as women today. Um, it's the lifestyle behaviors and the habits that we have. And those are the things that we don't necessarily ask. So we do, and I wanted to share some of the findings with you. We have really, we want to provide information that enables you to make informed decisions about your own body. So just a little bit of a flag about what we do at Hertility, because I think very oftentimes people hear Hertility, fertility, and they think that that is all we look at. Yes, in five years ago when we started, we wanted to look at what are all the things that could contribute to telling you how about your fertility. Um, are you fertile? Um, are there things contributing to uh, reduced fertility or even infertility and so the, all of that information all of those what ifs that I say whether it's uh, genetic whether it's environmental whether it's lifestyle whether it's menstrual whether it's a structural thing within your uterus all of those are the questions that we ask within the online health assessment and from there we have over 30 different panels of hormones that we will assign to somebody depending on their relative risk of a given pathology. So it may be that you have nothing that is flagging um, uh, on our, that health assessment for us, but we have very clever internally embedded algorithms within that health assessment that help us to determine what your relative risk is. And at present, we can predict 25 different conditions with 98 to 99% confidence. I can't tell you how excited I am to have run these numbers because to me, what it shows you is the combination of asking relevant questions and um, testing relevant anal analytes is incredibly powerful for determining a diagnosis in an indiv individual. And at present, diagnosis times for endometriosis take now, actually, it used to be seven years, then eight years. How is it that actually the average diagnosis time is now increasing, has increased to nine years? Um, we three to four years for PCOS. We are walking around undiagnosed because we actually don't have the outlet to give the information that would calculate whether we have a condition. And that is what we have really strived to create at Hertility. And moreover, that we've done this not just as a clinical entity or as scientists in a room. We are scientists in a room, but we've done it as if we're doing it for our best friends, which by the end of this, we've all become best friends, these scientists in a room. But to, to disseminate the information and to give you the report and the results in a digestible, understandable and clear way within that results section. So then building on from that, giving you access to either an ultrasound scan, should you need it to be able to speak to a fertility advisor or an gyne expert gynecologist. And then really be part of the community. So seeing how many of you are here today gives me hope for the community that we're building, that we're hoping to build um, to be part of something bigger than just your own health journey, to be the, the driver in your own health journey, but also to be part of a movement that says, I am contributing to better awareness. I am contributing to better data and therefore better outcomes for everybody who comes before and after me. So um, I'm glad you're all here. We'll get started. As I mentioned, this is the, the journey that I'm really proud of creating. And the reason I am, and even though it should be so simple, is that we expect this type of frictionless journey when it comes to ordering the most redundant of things online. Um, we expect to be able to look it up, it arrive at our house and us have it the following day or the day after. And that's really what we wanted to create with Hertility was actually what, what really matters when you order something is your health. Nothing else, really. Everything else we order is pretty redundant and trivial, except when it comes to our healthcare. And with the average diagnosis time taking so long and with the UK NHS wait lists being longer in gynecology than almost any other area and with them doubling that is where i feel so passionately that we need this access and um, this reliability and this affordability when it comes to what we have built on this clinical journey okay so we are um i'm going to walk through our reproductive report our commitment is to really make sure that we can close the gender health gap our commitment is to also view you as the expert we are all experts in our own body and i think that's one of the things that we learned very early on is that when we ask questions one of the questions we ask is about if you've ever been diagnosed and when people say no but i suspect something's up they are always right and that to me speaks volumes about how important it is 
for us to actually listen when somebody says, I don't feel right, as opposed to gaslighting, dismissing or ignoring. And equally, to tell you to listen to your own body and listen to that signal. Sometimes we often blame medical professionals on gaslighting, ignoring or, you know, dismissing. And we are the first people to dismiss our own symptoms. So making sure that we say, do you know what? I don't feel right. And maybe I'm going to listen to that signal. and I am going to action it and do something about it is, is just as important a message for individuals personally as it is for the healthcare community. So we are hoping that with this will be one of many. We launched uh, the reproductive report last year. Amazingly, we've actually gotten a lot of press uh, for this reproductive report. Um, we've been covered over the weekend in Sky News, The Guardian, The Daily Mail, The Telegraph, The Times for just one of the pillars. And I expected the same from last year's data. And actually, it was it was kind of crickets. Um, so hopefully we are gathering momentum. Hopefully we are seeing that actually news outlets are interested in this. Fingers crossed. This is like hopefully we've put our stake in the ground and now they're listening to the mother of all move movements at last. So the reproductive revelations that we uh, published last year were quite obvious. Well, some. We don't have enough data on women's reproductive health. Absolutely, we do not. Mothers-to-be need to be supported with robust preconception lifestyle advice. These are very similar to what we're seeing this year. We still don't have enough data and we definitely need to be giving more um, preconception advice. The third and the fourth, we published data on where women trying to conceive need to get specialist care sooner. That was because what we saw was that when women wait too long and rely on a rely on an NHS funded referral route, many are disappointed when they wait a very long time to see whether they are eligible through the NHS. And so what we saw from that third pillar was we did a study and we looked across all of the UK um care commissioning groups to say, from our data, what percentage of women who were actively trying to conceive or planning for the future were actually, would ever be eligible for NHS funded treatment? And nearly 70% would never be eligible for NHS funded treatment, but they would still wait. They would still have this two years before they were even given an appointment. And for us, that was, that was such a red flag to say, wow, we assume that should we struggle, the NHS will be there to protect and to guide us through. And actually it's the NHS that is struggling to, I guess, deal with the sheer volume of people who are going through this journey. So when we, when we look at the ridiculous criteria by which we have to fit in order to qualify for either additional testing or treatment, it's quite ridiculous. So we know that it's quite barbaric in that you have to have been actively trying to conceive for a very long time. You have to have been, you have to, it assumes you're in a same sex relationship. So we talk hugely about the disparities between um, same sex relationships and heterosexual relationships in that there is just a huge gap in provision of services and in the cost um, to individuals in trying to conceive. But number three, the fact that you would have to have had three or four more consecutive miscarriages or to be actively trying to conceive is outrageous as a criteria before referring for help. And what's more, as an eliminator, you have to be below a certain BMI, your hormones have to be within range. It's almost like you have to be already healthy in order to qualify. And if there's something wrong with you, then you might then you might not. So um the fourth was that we can't treat all women the same when it comes to their reproductive health. And I wanted to highlight some of these just in case any of you hadn't downloaded last year's reproductive report so that you would see the data from this was from over 122,000 women. And that, again, we launched a separate initiative on that, which was called our Black Women's Health Initiative. And that showcased um, the different behaviors and the different provision of services, whether you are a white woman or a black woman. So black women were on average 37 years of age before they would approach fertility versus 32 years of age before they would approach fertility if they were white. And what's more is that if you were white and you were actively trying to conceive, you were you are going to approach help after two years on average versus five years on average if you're a black woman. So that for us was enough of a motivation to say, we need to do more to interrogate the data, to find out why, to educate, to reach people and to say, we should not suffer worse outcomes or have delayed diagnosis times or time to help 
uh, depending on the color of our skin. So if anyone is interested in becoming involved in our Black Women's Health Initiative, please let me know as well. So this year's reproductive report, we actually have now hit over 420,000 women who have done our health assessment, but this was conducted on 325,430 uh, women and our all female uh, team of data scientists and researchers have really done multiple analyses. As you can imagine, there's almost endless things that we can look at in the data. Again, for me, building a resource or a biobank or a database that helps everybody is as a scientist, the most valuable thing that you can give back. So again, if there's any um, researchers who want to collaborate with us on our data, I'm a molecular geneticist. The questions I will ask of the data are very different to the questions that somebody, a neonatologist might ask, or for somebody who works in um, endometriosis versus all of these different aspects. We have consulted with many different specialists, but Every person asks very different questions. And so if you are somebody who has gone through this health, this health assessment and thinks, I wonder what the pre prevalence of X versus Y, or is there a link between X versus Y? Please do let me know. Love a collaboration. Okay, so reproductive revelation number one. Um, women, Most women don't have a basic understanding of their own biology. So this seems so obvious, but it's pointing out the obvious that sometimes we can miss in terms of helping people right we assume or we glaze over some of the fundamentals and therefore may not ask a relevant question when it comes to giving somebody help and they might have not thought about it so there is zero shaming in anyone in terms of their understanding i know that we have been starved of information when it comes to our own bodies and what's more we have been starved of basic education so i feel like this is our time to fight back and educate ourselves what's more is that i don't think any part of female reproductive biology should be considered too complex for all of us to understand. Um, and I think now is the time for us to start normalizing the terminology, normalizing even the endocrinology, like let's get friendly with endocrine factors um, so that everyone becomes a little bit more fertility fluent. Okay, so this is just an example to set the scene um, of why this question was asked. So when we ask the first initial question, what we ask is what brings you here? The reason we ask the question, what brings you here is because language is very important to individuals. If you are actively trying to conceive versus just curious, us giving you preconception tips or even suggesting that you speak to somebody for in terms of fertility versus you know general monitoring, we've listened to the feedback in that people don't necessarily wanna hear about preconception advice if they're just curious or if they're a long way off having, having their babies but you can see the breakdown of individuals. And what's really interesting to me here is that 60% are between the ages of 26 and 35, but about 20% are of this database are between the ages of 18 and 25. So we underestimate how much of an interest we have at such a young age about our reproductive health and our fertility. So you can see the different archetypes here from pe people who are planning to have babies in the future versus who are just curious about their reproductive health versus actively trying to conceive versus those who have symptoms and are really looking for a diagnosis. But when we ask people about this question, it helps us to understand their motivations thereafter. And if, for example, someone is actively trying to conceive, then we can hope for or at least advise on certain preconception lifestyle behaviors. If you're actively trying to conceive, you should be adhering to some some of the basics that would really help you in terms of your uh, success of getting pregnant. So when we looked at this data, we saw that 55% of users were proactively looking into their reproductive health before the age of 30. Now this goes against the narrative, which is that 30 years old hits, the tick, the clock starts ticking, and that you all of a sudden take an interest in this. Or the 35 hits and you're freaking out, or the 39 hits and you're in panic stations. Actually, we have this desire to know this from a much younger age, and so we should be catering to that. The idea that you cannot be tested on the NHS for your fertility or your reproductive health, unless you have symptoms or something's wrong or unless you're actively trying to conceive, really is quite damaging. We should be able to check in on our fertility and reproductive health from a younger age, not least of which, because when you look at the global statistics of one in six being a heterosexual couples being affected by infertility, and we don't know what the actual general rate is because 50 
fertility is 50-50, then we really should be screening for this on a population based level. We should be screening not just for fertility, but for any of the different other risk factors that could impact your reproductive health and your fertility, like we do at fertility. So um, about 47% were uh, currently planning for future babies. Now, one of the things that we've learned from this um, is that we ask, are you planning for future babies? And a lot of people say, yes, I'm planning for future babies. They may be planning it for next month, for next year, or in five years. And that's something we're definitely going to hone in on is like, how soon are you planning those future babies? And then amazingly, the prevalence of these reproductive health conditions. So one in five who are planning for future reported at least one pre-existing reproductive health condition. That is a lot of different people who are planning who may struggle legitimately because of a gynecological condition or a reproductive health condition that could impact it. And this is why I talk about population-based screening, not just for fertility, but for these one in five different conditions that could affect you so that you aren't one of these individuals who spends five years trying to conceive and at the end of that gets a diagnosis to say oh this was why and I really want us to be able to you know break through this idea that every one of us is the same but actually that we build on this personalized medicine based approach to understanding our own personal risks so the next was that from obviously as you all know from a very young age the only thing we are taught about when it comes to fertility is how not to get pregnant. Whatever you do, don't get pregnant. So when we ask people about you know, fertility, they only decide to take a vested interest in it when they come off their form of contraception because they do want to get pregnant. But when we looked at women who, when we ask women about their menstrual cycles, it's highly informative. And this is why I'm really excited. We've spent, spent the morning talking about all the different features of our app that can be different about um, menstrual cycle monitoring. And all of these gaps in the literature about a normal bleed. And we have a, the, the conversation is so, is so um, juicy, I will say, um, because it is basically a group of women discussing the finer details of how they bleed, when they bleed, the color of their bleed, whether there's a gap and then they bleed again. And I think that is very informative going forward especially when we can start to build a picture that helps people understand what is a normal menstrual cycle. So 27,655 women had no idea how long their menstrual cycle was. So we say, how long is your menstrual cycle? No idea. Imagine having a period every single month and having no idea how long your cycle was. That is robbing somebody of fundamental information about how their month may be, how their day might be, how their fertility might be, or whether something is actually wrong. Um, 120,000 said they had regular cycles, but when we looked, their cycles are actually irregular. So that highlights how few of us understand what a regular menstrual cycle is in terms of length, in terms of the length of the cycle. So from day one to the next time you bleed, the full month, the length of your period, how long you're actually bleeding for, how much you bleed for, and how, how and all of those are such key parameters to your overall reproductive health. So it, it's amazing that so many people would say, I've got regular cycles, but they have no idea what regular is, and they actually have quite irregular cycles. But most shockingly, of those who were actively trying to conceive, 42% didn't know when their fertile window was. So one of the hardest things that people learn when they're trying to get pregnant and not getting pregnant is that actually your fertile window is very, very small. You only have a few days in every single month that you can get pregnant. And yet, again, with this, this fear of fertility has us believing that we could get pregnant at any single day of the month. And when we understand and start to dig into the fact that there's only a small window in every single month that we can get pregnant and the rest we can't, it makes you realize how dependent we are on over precaution, right? And how much easier it would be to just educate women about their menstrual cycles, about when they might be ovulating and about precautions around that time. Now, should they wish to explore other options, hormonal contraception or other forms of additional contraception, great, fine. But there are many for whom that they feel like they have been kept on a form of contraception on the off chance they get pregnant when actually it would have been easier for them to just monitor. 
So I think understanding when your fertile window is, especially when trying to conceive, it was amazing to me that nearly 50% of people didn't actually know when they could get pregnant, because what it spells out to me is that they don't actually know how to get pregnant. Knowing how to get pregnant is not having sex. How to get pregnant is having sex when you are fertile, not any other time. So something that doesn't surprise me at all, um, probably because we eat, sleep and breathe, um, the feelings of our people um, is that mental health and menstrual health are inextricably linked. So we know how much we, our mood is determined by our menstrual cycles. We know how um, much our moods fluctuate. We know that we are um, victim to hormones. Uh, we know this every single month. The narrative, the public narrative, always uh, lends itself to premenstrual um, symptoms and premenstrual mood, which really frustrates me that we don't focus on the rest of the month when you're follicular and you're feeling great and you're looking great and you have high energy. You're equally hormonal then, but it's working in your favor. We only ever, we only ever talk about a negative narrative when it comes to being hormonal, and that is the time of the month which is the end of the month and, and actually we really should be giving a little bit more credence to the fact that if you can feel great when you ovulate and not feel so great when you menstruate or just before that that this is actually significantly impacting our mental health so when we go back to this question um what we asked is how have you been feeling recently? So we know that stress um, impacts our hormones, it, it impacts our fertility, but actually much of the data around stress is quite um, subjective, of course. I mean, do you have two people who live very different lives, could be very stressed, equally stressed, but you know, when, when you look at, a, at an objective lens, you might say this person doesn't really need to be stressed, but they're feeling it, right? So from an endocrine perspective, they are still feeling it. Their cortisol is still probably through the roof. But I, I was actually quite sad seeing the results that of 325,000 women, only 7% described themselves as calm, relaxed, and confident. The majority identified as either completely stressed and overwhelmed or somewhat stressed. 30% are neutral, that's fine. But when a majority, 63%, fall within that stress category, we really need to recognize that this is something that our society is not catering to and that our lives are actually quite frenetic, uh, demanding and disruptive. And the impact that this could be having on our menstrual health and every other part of our health, not just our reproductive health. So when we looked, what we wanted to dig in further was to say, okay, do we see that stress actually does correlate with uh, symptoms? And what we see is that here are some of the top, the top symptoms reported, by the way, are really important. So when we look at your symptoms, when we, given that we are a reproductive health company, you would assume that the most prevalent symptoms are relating to menstrual dysfunction or cramps or any of those things specifically pertaining to our reproductive function. And actually look at these fatigue, anxiety, depressive or low mood, painful periods comes number four, followed by irritability, migraines, headaches, feeling cold. Each of these, the top five symptoms are actually mental health related. We are struggling significantly as a population of women with fatigue, with anxiety, with depressive or low mood. And yet when you have a consultation about anything to do with fertility, reproductive health or a reproductive condition, that is not on the table when it comes to a discussion or nor is it on the table when it comes to a solution. So the solutions that are presented to you as an individual simply aren't given because that's, you know, that's psychology. That's clinical psychology that's a different area and so it really frustrates me that we isolate the top and bottom half of our bodies when actually from a hormone perspective the majority of the signaling comes from our, our thyroid our hypothalamus our pituitary these are the signaling glands that are within our brain that talk to our ovaries to produce and to stimulate and to essentially create a normal menstrual cycle and so separating out the roles that they might have on each other is actually 
just not clever. And actually having some data that really shows number one, the number of the symptoms reported, but number two, when you correlate stress levels and symptom levels, what you'll see is those who are calm, relaxed and confident have fewer number of symptoms reported versus those who are completely stressed and overwhelmed. The number of symptoms that we report as individuals directly relates to our stress levels. And so one thing we still don't know is which is causing which. It's possibly quite a delicate interplay between the two, because if you're feeling a lot of symptoms, you're going to feel stressed. But it could be that there's a huge role that the stress is playing on exacerbating any symptoms that we are feeling. What's more is that you that reproductive health conditions, again, which are completely separated, bearing in mind that one in 10 have PCOS, you are at a three times risk of depression and anxiety if you have PCOS. And yet the majority of patients, when they present during consultations, do not have anything relating to their mental health discussed. We actually did a study last year where we looked at the reason you didn't get a diagnosis as somebody who has PCOS. Um, and that's where we got the data about a lot of self-dismissal. So a lot of people do self-dismiss and don't bring themselves to the doctor. They don't take, they don't think their symptoms warrant investigation or medical health, or they're embarrassed. But again, the number one symptom, and this is not on any of the guidelines for diagnosing PCOS, the number one symptom reported was mental health related. And yet it was the last thing to be discussed in any appointment. The things that were discussed in any appointment with a provider were either weight or fertility. Now, if you have a weight problem, of course you know this. You are already living and breathing it. It is your daily struggle or your daily juggle, or you've either lived with it, but you'd certainly know about it. So discussing that front line and center and in the absence of addressing a mental health um, condition really is just leaving somebody without the tools to actually equip themselves to really live a happier and healthier lives. So equally, you are at two to three times risk of mental health disorders in women with reproductive health disorders. We should be prioritizing this awareness about mental health and reproductive health conditions, but also signposting the risk for the sheer volume of women who have reproductive health conditions, that they may be at a higher risk or undoubtedly are at a higher risk for mental health disorders. So what you see here on the graph is the comparison between those who are calm, relaxed and confident in this mauvey purpley color and um, compared to those who are completely stressed and overwhelmed. And what you look at is the number of pre-existing conditions. And this is quite similar to correlating the stress levels and the symptom levels. But actually what you see is people who have a condition are far more likely to be completely stressed and overwhelmed. And that stands to reason. So we should really be giving additional tools to individuals with a pre-existing condition. So then when we looked at time spent trying to conceive, one of the things that people always talk about is, you know, if you're actively trying to conceive, that really unhelpful piece of advice, which says, relax, just try not thinking about, try not think about it. Just, you know, try and try and meditate, try to do yoga. I mean, I don't know if anyone else does meditation. I do not, because when I do try to do it, I just sit there and I think about my problems or I write mental lists in my head. So trying to tell somebody who is consumed by this journey to try and conceive, to not think about it and to say, well, like, you know, stress is going to impact you is really unhelpful. But it's good to have some actual correlation here to see the impact that time spent trying to conceive has on somebody. And what I view this from is both a friendship perspective. Please be kind to your friends who are going through a journey where they're trying to conceive because they are much more likely the longer they spend trying to conceive to be vulnerable, stressed and overwhelmed. But from a workplace environment, we are expected to show up to work and to be the same person every day, to bring it, to have all of the energy, to have all of the attention when actually this is an all consuming journey that significantly, as you can see, contributes to an absolute overwhelming level of stress and feeling overwhelmed the longer you spend trying to conceive. And so again, it's a it's a little bit of a chicken and egg because when we think about, you know, is it that the people who are more stressed spend longer trying to conceive or is it the fact that they've spent so long trying to conceive that they're more stressed? It's it's both really. But providing people with a safer space within the workplace um, 
is something that I think everyone should flag in the workplace, especially given how many people go through, uh, are going through fertility cycles at any one time in the workplace. 3% of babies in the US are IVF. 10% of babies in Finland are IVF. 12% of babies in Spain are IVF babies. We have a huge percentage of babies being born through IVF. Think how many people are then therefore going through an IVF cycle at any one time in the workplace. So if your workplace doesn't have benefits or support for this, please email us and we'll support you with that. Okay, reproductive revelation number three, we need proper advice for our preconception vices. Now, this is what hit the newspapers all over the weekend. Um, this is what we have been on the news for is actually some of the pillars within this because amazingly, no data exists to date. Now, last year's report, we highlighted similar shocking statistics in the number of women who were actively trying to conceive who were taking drugs or drinking or smoking. But this year, we wanted to look into a little bit more detail at those numbers and potentially why. So bear with me. I am aware this is a busy slide with stats and figures and graphs, and that's the love language of scientists. But if you walk with me through these, what I want to highlight is that women who are actively trying to conceive, 7% of them are still taking recreational drugs. 14% of women who are planning for future babies are taking recreational drugs. Okay, so did the difference between when you're planning a future baby versus you're actively trying to conceive still, it has halved, but it shouldn't be that such a high percentage of women who are actively trying to conceive are taking recreational drugs. That should be a non-negotiable, please don't do that. It affects you and it affects the future health of your fetus, irrespective of whether you get pregnant now or in three months. Those are the eggs that you have within your body and you are you are a vessel that should mind them, especially in that preconception phase. Um, for Though it seems like a small amount, 4% of those actively trying to conceive were consuming more alcohol than the NHS guidelines for a healthy adult. And when I say more alcohol, I mean a lot of alcohol while trying to conceive. And actually a huge percent, about 50% are still drinking while trying to conceive. And we know from the literature and from research that depending on when you drink and how much you drink, you can significantly impact your chance of getting pregnant the following month because of when you drank in your, in your cycle. So drinking at a time where your ovaries are nurturing and trying to mature these beautiful follicles that have been there for, for so long and trying to give them the best possible chance in the hopes that one will ovulate in that three month life cycle prior to that egg being released, everything you consume is going to impact that egg and that egg's viability. So cutting everything out is to me, the most important thing that we could tell people to do. And when we looked across the impact of smoking and vaping, what you can see is we see similar levels of people who smoke versus vape. But what the evidence already shows is that we know from years and years and years of literature that um, we have uh, that smoking significantly reduces your fertility. However, we are still seeing that the NHS actually provides um, vapes to pregnant women who are trying to give up smoking to try and you know have a healthier option it's still being kept touted as a um healthier alternative to smoking in the absence of any evidence by the way any evidence to really categorically say that um and so what we wanted to look at was to say can we provide similar evidence for that has been provided for smoking for vaping when it comes to our fertility and what we see is that your amh levels in other words the number of follicles that you have that are ready to be released and fertilized uh, is significantly lower in vapors versus non-vapors. Now, this is the first study of this kind to actively show through data that vaping is having a significant impact on fertility. So I mentioned about those who are trying to conceive, but when we looked at women who were trying to conceive and whether they vaped, 22% were actually vaping or occasionally vaping. And irrespective of anything, when we compare these two groups, um, vapors versus non-vapors, we see a significant difference in their average number of, in their average AMH level. Now, AMH people talk about quite frequently, but it is essentially anti-malarian hormone, and it's the hormone that is produced by all of the 
follicles in your ovaries. And when I talk about follicles, I love to do this like jazz hands. All of the follicles in your ovaries host the eggs or the would-be eggs. So when I say would-be eggs, some, they start off quite immature. And then depending on the um, secretion of hormones, you, they can mature and be released. So when you look at a significant reduction in that, it might be compounded by other lifestyle factors that go alongside that. But what we see is that we finally have some evidence that says this isn't a healthier alternative, especially when it comes to fertility. And if you want to try and con to try to conceive, you should cut it out. Okay. The fourth pillar, and thank you, there's so many of you still there, I'm delighted. <laughs> Clearly, this is of interest to everybody, but the fourth pillar is about menopause. Now, at the beginning, I showed you diff four different archetypes that we ask. Are you actively trying to conceive? Are you planning for future babies? Are you experiencing symptoms? Or are you just curious? There's actually two other archetypes that we added January of last year, and that was do you think you're perimenopausal or are you menopausal? And what amazed me was that we never did any promotion or advertising around our menopause or perimenopause service that we do offer. Um, the reason being, we just wanted to make this available, learn from it, learn from what, from what people wanted. And within only a few months, we had over 12,000 women select this, I think I'm perimenopausal. And what was incredible to see was the age range by which women fell under. So I remember arguing with somebody about why we need to check in on menopause or whenopause or our, this is what we say, whenopause is like, when will I go into menopause? Because it's this wide window. And so when we, just to give a, a little bit of a, a definition of perimenopause and menopause, we know that menopause is defined retrospectively. You are in menopause once you have had a full year of no periods. And then everything relating before that is that transitional period where you're really losing your estrogen and your ovarian reserve is going down, down, down until it's at zero. When it's at zero, obviously you will then have no periods because you don't have a monthly cycle because there is no egg to release. And all of the changes that happen to your body throughout that transition, which can last up to 12 years, are cognitive, vasomotor, bodily, mo mo mobility, uh, you can have pelvic symptoms and obviously major psychological symptoms. The most, the highest, the most frequent age for suicide in women is when they are perimenopausal. Do we warn women of that? No. The most common time that women will have a divorce when they're perimenopausal. Do we counsel people about that? No. But when we looked across the different symptoms reported by our fertility users, when they reported feeling perimenopausal, Again, what you see is look at these top reported symptoms, fatigue, anxiety, irritability, depressive or low mood, brain fog. So many of them are related to our mental health and so few of them actually fall within the clinical guidelines to actually give you a diagnosis and therefore provide you with help as a perimenopausal woman. So when we look at the criteria, so this is the diagnostic criteria for perimenopause and menopause, the NICE guidelines suggest that if you have POI, which is premature ovarian insufficiency, that's anything that happens under the age of 40. And then the age is obviously very important. So under 45 versus over 45. If you are under 45, typically they will say there's no reason to test you at all. So we wanted to look and say how many women actually do qualify as being perimenopausal and, and, and are rep reporting perimenopausal symptoms under the age of 45, it was over 30%. Uh, as opposed to just recently, the NHS has said, OK, women who are 45, we should maybe do an investigation. But what we see is that according to the guidelines, people fall outside those guidelines. And moreover, we don't actually give help or there is no guideline associated help for individuals who have these very profound mental health um, symptoms that are very much associated with the unfortunate catalogue of symptoms associated with perimenopause. So when we look about this, what there's two ways to look at it. We could say that because we see so many more narratives in the media about menopause, more women are talking about it and leading them to believe that they are going through perimenopause. 
And maybe they're incorrecting, incorrectly self-diagnosing that they're perimenopausal. So when we actually looked at the guidelines, what we looked at was of all of the women who said, I think I'm perimenopausal, what percentage of them actually were according to the diagnostic guidelines? And only 6% are actually clinically falling within those guideline definitions of being perimenopausal. What I find difficult with that statistic is that 94% of users, therefore, who recognize in themselves that secret factor, I do not feel myself, I think I'm perimenopausal, that is a dramatic hormonal shift in your life that makes you feel quite different. 94% of those who are really struggling, if you look at the list of symptoms, mostly mental health related symptoms, that still require medical attention will not get the requisite medical attention, nor will they get qualify for HRT should they actually require it. And I think this is part of um, my mission in wanting people to really understand what their baseline hormones are. If you fall within the reference range, I often talk about reference ranges. If you fall within the reference ranges of normal, which on the NHS are very wide, very wide reference ranges so that nobody's on the outskirts so that there's less that should be done. Don't kill me for saying that. But they have very wide reference ranges. In other words, most people are going to fit within this. Only in extreme cases of high or low are you outside the ranges. But given the, the, the width of the reference ranges for a blood result, if you at 20 and 30 really fall kind of like within the upper limit that you're just you're just somebody who has consistently high estrogen testosterone whatever it is that's who you are and you're at the bottom end by the time you're 40 42 43 even 39 you are a significantly different person to the person that you have always been and you will feel this change However, according to the guidelines, you fall within the normal range. So there's nothing that can be done for you. And that's why I think everyone understanding a baseline of what their normal is. So when somebody says to me, I don't need a fertility test, I don't want a baby. I'm like, irrespective of your desire to have a baby, you should know what your hormones are doing. You should know what your symptoms are doing and you should know what's your norm. Or um, everything's fine for me now. I don't need a test. You should know that's the perfect time when everything is fine for you. That is your gold standard. And you can use that as your me measuring or yardstick for what is normal to you versus abnormal to you, not according to a reference range or a guideline. Okay, cool. So the difference in the number of users uh, self-reporting being perimenopausal and those meeting the diagnostic criteria is huge yet nothing is done in terms of provision of service or even acknowledging, identifying and classifying this group of individuals as having something that could be wrong. So in 2023 alone, across all of our different forms of intake, whether it was email, whether it was health assessment, whether it was um, engagements with us, 983,196 people are better informed about their bodies. And that to me is... I want there to be zeros after that in the next few years, because I think that we are living in a dark room and that somebody needs to keep the lights on. Um, and that of those 325,430 have taken that first step. So when we talk about that first step, what I mean is that they have completed a health assessment. There's different areas of um, data that we can we can look to. And the, this health assessment data that we ask about is so important for us getting a general gauge on the trends and the associations, but also then being able to really infer what people's risks are. So what we're really proud about is that, as I mentioned, we just ran our analysis on our numbers. We have an incredible data uh, and machine learning and AI team um, who are, I probably heckle it too many times of the day, um, but we've just done um, an analysis showing our predictive capability across 25 different conditions and it's between 98 and 99 percent confidence across 25 different conditions just through that health assessment and blood results so if you know someone who is struggling please please send them our way because it is our mission to help people get results um that can really inform better outcomes for them so what's amazing as well is that um even though we stratify for people who are experiencing symptoms versus just curious, still of all of the people who've done a blood test with us, 60% have found out that they have at least one 
hormone out of range. It shows you that we are walking around with our hormones not in check and that so many of the symptoms associated with hormone imbalance, we just ignore because we assume that's your status quo. That is who you are. Maybe you're just a little bit lethargic. Maybe you're not sleeping enough. Maybe you're not eating well. When actually it could be a hormone that's really messing you over and that in addressing or finding that hormone imbalance, you could really do something about it. And um, 56% of people received results indicative of a diagnosis. I still um, get happy every time I think of the time somebody came up to me and gave me a hug and said, oh, I got a diagnosis because of fertility. And I thought that's, that's a strange thing to celebrate, but because she had been through so many appointments, redundant appointments where they had focused on other aspects like her weight or something else, and she did not get a diagnosis as a result of not addressing her as a complete human being she was so relieved and grateful to actually get a diagnosis it was actually amazing to see how much of a burden a lack of diagnosis can be because you feel like you're going crazy and then 28 percent were provided on necessary onward care and that is really what we're trying to build is all of the necessary requisite steps whatever it is that you need in terms of your clinical journey or support um and i think this is my moment to tell you to keep an eye out for our app launch we are working hard on building our app so that you can view any risk factors you can monitor your um, symptoms we can finally start to see cyclical based associations with some symptoms and your overall health and i think this is going to be an incredible game changer for women's health in terms of finally all rallying together and getting this data and making better informed clinical decisions but equally contributing to the data that just doesn't exist and I think this is something that I this is we're nurturing this like it is our own baby as well and then if anyone wants to help we did launch a range of merch with meaning and all the proceeds go towards funding our clinical trials we are everyone thinks we are a big corporation we are not we are a small team of very dedicated people who are really just trying to do what we can and given the lack of funding into women's health which is sickening and given the lack of um, venture funding into women's health companies we launched our merch with meaning so that people could wear it as a symbol to say i am doing something to help um improve the, the chances of uh, the next generation and hopefully us soon um, so do support that as well. And then just if you want, if you don't follow us on socials at all, please do. Everything helps. If you have had a fertility test and not done a trust pilot, please do. Um, we work really hard to listen to every single person. Um, and that is not an easy thing to do. So hopefully you've learned something from the data today. Um, if you have any questions that you would like to ask of our data set, please let us know. If you would like to get in touch about a potential research project, let us know. And if there's any other things that you want to just reach out or just be supportive of, um, just shout and we're always here. So thank you so much for joining. I'm actually going to take a quick look at the questions because I have a few minutes to do so. Um, this meeting is being recorded and it will be sent afterwards uh, to anyone who's joining. And I can't, the questions are actually a little bit long, so we might follow up afterwards with them. And um, just, yeah, support along. We're doing our absolute best. It's a, it's a nightmare out there in terms of uh, getting this justified. Um, somebody told me recently that they were delighted that the UK government had pledged 150 million into women's health. And I said, they've just pledged 8.3 billion into fixing potholes. So I think there's a lot more we can do when we represent 52% of the planet. So um, thank you for joining me and I hope to see you along soon.